Welcome to Conversations, uh, Lehman College's new series of television discussions with major theater artists of our time. Uh, this is the second of a two-part series on Lanford Wilson, uh, our distinguished Pulitzer Prize winning playwright and my old friend and personal inspiration. Uh, in our last talk, Lanford, we discussed uh, uh, your past and uh, how you got to New York from from the Ozarks and from the uh, Ozarks, from yeah. the Ozarks to and Chicago to New York to San Diego to Chicago to New York, right. and uh, we also discussed off off Broadway, off Broadway, and the uh, at least we getting ended to Broadway, yeah. getting to Broadway, and um, I wanted to find out a little more what happened. Uh, uh, Circle Rep, you you were involved with Circle Rep for how many years? Uh, we started in '69, and I think it goes. To my participation went to 94, so quite a while. Uh, what? 65, 94, say, uh, that's 30 years. It's, I didn't it need to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> this for uh, a theater is a, a long time. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, the it's Moscow the longest. Art Theater didn't Probably, last no, that long. No, no, neither The Globe the Theater didn't last the Globe, long. The, the Globe may have, I don't know. No, it didn't. I wasn't there, the group <laughs> didn't. The group, group didn't. theater lasted less than that, five years, something so like that. So the longevity of this group was amazing. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I wondered, uh, uh, did you feel that the uh, Circle Rep uh, had its day and, and, uh, and had its demise was a, uh, um, a natural course of event, or did you feel it could have gone on longer? Or what, what, how did you feel about that? Mm. That's a question I've always wanted to ask you. Uh, that's a question I've never wanted to answer. Uh, uh, all right, s a series of events. First, uh, after 20 years, uh, Marshall had burned out the, the artistic director and the founder of, of the play, the inspiration behind the entire place and the style and everything else. Uh, Marshall was burned out by that time, and he said, I cannot go on. And he had gone on, as it turned out, we'd found out just about the same length as everyone else had gone here, you know, about. 20 years as an artistic director of a theater is, you know, through all the changes and all of that is about all you can do. So he lasted about two years after that, trying trying to get out. And, uh, and then finally we decided, we had a board of directors, which was about eight or ten people, and we got a few more people in who didn't really have a clue what we were doing. We were really an actor and writer's theater, and it was, uh, it was, we wrote Act, uh, the writers wrote for the group, and and the group did it. It was an amazing process. We uh, any number of times I would I would, ha would have a scene. I was writing for specific actors in the company, and they knew it. And if, if it took six months to write a play, or a year, or only six weeks, whatever, uh, or six years, the uh, I had the actor there to say, "Could you please read this scene, the two of you?" So I can hear it, and they'd read it, and and in the process learn what character they were playing and who their character was. So they had known for a year the sort of play they were going to be in and the the character. So in the back of their minds, they knew exactly who they were going to play a year from now. And then as they saw the play progress, they read other scenes. You had the same process, very similar in in uh, uh, in, in as is. Right. You know. Uh, bit by bit by and bit, later by bit with working Riga. it, yeah. Uh, the, the and and so so anyway, by the time they got it on, they had so that's the kind of theater we were, and it was all from the company, and we made a huge number of people, uh, actors, into stars. I mean, they became very famous, and so, and uh, well, if you can consider William Hurt and Jeff Daniels and and. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris Reeve. Reeve, yeah, if you can consider you don't him famous. You get bigger than no. that. And, uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, and then when Marshall left and Tanya carried on the work very well, Tanya added Barrison. Craig Lucas to the play, to the playwrights group, which was one of the most important things that ever happened there. Added uh, uh, Alec Baldwin to the company and a bunch of other people who were equally fantastic. Uh, and uh, and she lasted eight years. And then said, I've, I've had it. And the directors decided, we don't want to be that kind of theater. We, we, you know, you have all these stars and they come back so rarely. We want to just do, be stars. We want right. to 
just use stars and have the playwrights write for stars. And we said, that's not what we've been doing. That has nothing to do with what, what we're about. And they said, well, that's what we want to do. And so instead of having the, the man, Michael Powell, who had been the director of the lab for eight years, this lab that I said that we, were, we always had in conjunction with many, your play came out of that, came out of the lab. Right. Fifth of July came out of the lab. Uh, and a the lot lab of them became came out the model for playwrights' labs all, all over, over the, the country. There, there was everyone such who a does thing it. Before. Everyone yeah. who who did, did developmental theater for the next generation. I just had to write a recommendation for uh, Marshall for a, a regency professor in, out in Arizona and uh, Arizona State. And uh, one of the type of questions is, what did he do that we consider important? I said. Well, how do you consider inventing the process of developing a play in America? That's what he invented. Uh, the, the lab, the workshop, that, that's, what, that's what we did at Circle Rep. And now you can't walk down the street without bumping into about six people who are developing plays. And film plays. companies as yeah. well. It, this is yeah. the most influential thing imaginable. And we're all products of that. Oh, yeah. We're all products of that. So, um, But I, the new d board of directors didn't want to do that. and. So Marshall resigned, Tanya resigned, and I resigned. And they had a resounding success at, uh, with their very first show. And the playwright, who was a star, refused to have uh, understudies. The, it was a three-character play. The other actor in the play, who was a star, got sick. And we had no understudies. And we had this massive hit and had to close after about four performances after the reviews. And the theater just started, that was just like knocking two legs out from under. Uh, the, the theater started to collapse immediately. So it wasn't completely the board of directors' fault and the new artistic director's fault. But uh, I always say largely, however, it really wasn't. It was, they had some very bad luck. Right. Very bad ideas and very bad luck. Anyone? I uh, can't be totally nice. <laughs> about that. So, uh, so, and there went Circle Rep. What, uh, but since that time, your career has been continuing and it's been wonderful. It took a while. Uh, the first year after I, w after I was no longer at Circle Rep, and after Circle Rep was no longer there, uh, which was only about a year after we all left, uh, that summer, I was depressed the entire summer and didn't know why. Is that stupid? You know, you have no one to write for, Lanford. Why are you depressed? Uh, I was. Someone said, "How did your summer go?" And I said, "With some of the most intelligent people in the country coming to my house, and being there all summer long, and and talking, and there was there wasn't one sentence that rose above the self-pitying and banal the entire damn summer. Uh, how did your summer go? You know, <laughs> uh, and I didn't know why. I mean, it was so stupid. I had no idea. After a year, I said, Lanford, your damn theater company is closed. You have no one to write for. Of course you're depressed. Who wouldn't be? Uh, and I hadn't written a word during that time. I had I'd been working on a play for years uh, called, uh, called Sympathetic Magic. And uh, I've been working on it for years and was getting nowhere. And I did have, during that drought, I had an idea that I said, oh, fuck, I know how that play should go. I know exactly what that should be. And, uh, but I had no ambition to do it, and there was no one to write it for, and there was no, I had, I had gotten into the habit of writing for people and writing with the idea that <coughs> this is going to be done at such and such a date, and if it's, you're not going to have it ready, you better know early enough along so you can tell them, and I always told Marshall, have a substitute ready to go in when I collapse and can't, and can't finish it in time. And the bastard actually did. <laughs> and and one of them was when I was trying to write the Mound Builders, and I said, I can't do it. I'm, I need more time. He put in The Seahorse, which was one of the biggest hits we ever had. Damn him. Damn his eyes, <laughs> yeah. And with Conchetta Ferron, everyone got an OB. I think it was our first round, complete round of OBs. The, you know, everyone involved with it got an OB. Uh, anyway, where in the hell were we? Um, well, I'm not sure, but I like where we are. Okay. And, yeah. uh, um, I wanted to know, how did you, uh, uh, last season, wasn't it, or was the season before you, uh, they did a complete retrospective of your, of your career at Signature At Theater. Signature, yes. What was that like for you? 
What year was that? It was 2002. Two, 2002-2003 season. Uh, and this is 2003-2004 season. Now. Right. Uh, and they have Bill Irwin, uh, who's going to be, you know, a real hot season. Anyway, uh, that came about. He called me up and said, we want to do uh, you next year. And I said, well, it's about damn time. And uh, they do a different playwright every year, and this was their 12th year they were going to do. So it had been a while. Uh, and then we had great fun trying to pick the ones that, that we wanted to do because I had been rather prolific. And I wanted to do the Mound Builders, but we had done it real badly in a very bad uh, production, Marshall's last year, when he had nothing left, and I had nothing left at that time. And it was abominable. It wasn't wonderful. And so the critics would have memories of that, and I didn't want to see I, I kind of wanted to see it again, but I didn't want them saying, this lousy play, why did they choose this lousy mm -hmm. play? Uh, so aside from that, we, we were in pretty, pretty much in agreement. They sort of fell into place. We wanted to do a play called Tally's Folly, which is just two characters. They wanted to do it because of the tone of it. And our, our which you actors, won the Pulitzer Prize for. Yeah, it's the one I've won, won the prize for. And, and uh, the actress that we wanted to do, and we didn't want to do it without her, uh, got pregnant. I tell you, they have no regard at all for art. <laughs> uh, Cynthia Nixon. And uh, she got. Sex in the City now. Sex in the City now, <laughs> yeah. This is the last year. Uh, and uh, so we, we canceled it. We said, no, we don't want to do that then with someone else. We don't want to just. Very smart, because very often you say, oh, well, we have the guy, we have the gal, we have the guy, we have the director, we have the set. Who else can we shove into that, you know, to replace her? Very bad, because, because we had started with Cynthia. We want to see Cynthia play that part. Well, you don't, you know, you don't pull, right. you don't pull that prop out. You know, one of the others, maybe. You can change set designers, maybe, but you, not, not the reason you wrote, the reason you wanted to produce the play. So we asked the director, Joe Bonney, who's one, she's wonderful, what else would you like to do? And she said, I want to do 5th of July. I'm dying to do 5th of July. So, okay, it became 5th of July. Now, you had a, a big hit with that, uh, that season of your play. It was their most successful season yes. so far. Yeah. And, uh, um, After 12, they finally got around to me and had a good season. Huh? Actually, they'd had good seasons all along. They, uh, a particular hit was Burn This. Well, they, they had a very smart thing. They, they did a very smart thing. They realized it, uh, someone who's acted for them before and someone who's on the board uh, and also wanted to be a, in the season and wanted to do a play of mine. Uh, they just knew he was just too big a star to, to do in their 120-seat theater because he's, he's like a big fan of young people. And, uh, and so when... when so, uh, our, the artistic director went out to Ed Norton, who, I said, is on the board and has acted there before years ago, before he was Ed Norton. And uh, Edward read, uh, in a group, they read, I wish I'd have gone out to see it. They read uh, Serenading Louis and, uh, and Burn This. And in Serenading Louis, uh, they, they had, oh, what's the wonderful woman's name from, uh, from Friends? I would love to say who she... Married to Brad Pitt. Again? Jennifer Adam? Anderson. Jen, uh, Jennifer, An Jen. Jennifer Anderson, who I'm mad for. Aniston, yeah. Yeah, Aniston. Yeah. Red, you know, red in, in Serenading uh, Louie, and I would love to have seen that. Anyway, anyhow, uh, they decided to do, uh, Edward decided he wanted to do Burn This. And so they rented, uh, they, they moved, instead of doing it in their 120 seat house, they did it at a 500 seat house. In, Union Square, and we had to beat people away with our umbrellas. You know, uh, it was a big, big hit for them. And of course, it was five times the number of, of tickets that they usually sold. So, yeah, it, it did very well. It, it, it would. He, he came to me and said, "We have taken in enough money to run for two years on this. You know, enough profit." Well, that's wonderfully great. That was really great. So it didn't do badly for them, and it didn't do badly for me. It was a big, big hit of a season for Maybe them. they'll do a second signature season of you. No, I don't You're think prolific. they're, not, they're You're not prolific doing that. enough. No. 
They've already selected the next two, and they're great. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, Paula Vogel, I can't wait. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I cannot wait. Yes. I can't remember who the other one is, but it's also someone I'm crazy about. Sorry, whoever it was. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you, and you hinted at August some of Wilson. this. Sorry. Can't oh. wait. Right? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. They're going to sell out. They're going to have to move to other theaters. Do you theaters have to be a that. Wilson to write plays? It helps. <laughs> With Robert and Doric and That's right. August. Yeah. Uh, what prompts you to write a play, Lance? To write what? A play? Play. I said it was a miracle. I, I, I thought I was going to write a story, and I said, oh, this sounds more like a play, and I started writing it and said I'm a playwright. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I, I, I used that in... Um, I use the design of that experience for, in a play called Angels Fall, there's a, a young tennis player. And he says, uh, when I was 11, I, you know, I saw these two guys playing tennis. And, you know, I was built like uh, uh, a, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, whatever, a string bean. But that wasn't what it was. It was a better image than that. Anyway, they, they had a break and a guy threw the, racket at him and a ball and said hit one and he did and you know and he said there no one was over there it was an ace and he said I knew right then I, I, uh, I was supposed to write play I was supposed to write plays I knew he was supposed to be a tennis player uh, it's a nice little it's a nice little speech well, what prompts you to write new uh, plays now what, what is oh well I, I always wrote plays for people ah. and, uh, and I and and so I wrote plays for companies and when the company dissolved I dissolved I, I had no more interest in writing plays. I mean, I had great interest, but no, no impetus. And well, now you're writing again. Well, then I was writing again. Yeah. So immediately, almost, uh, when theater started realizing, hey, Lambert's not working. It, you know, he's got no one to write for. The Purple Rose, which Jeff Daniels Theater in Chelsea, Michigan, uh, was based on on the Circle Rep. Jeff Daniels is one of our one of our big important stars there. Uh, and one of the few that, after he got famous, kept coming back. Uh, Jeff opened a theater in his hometown based on, on Circle Rep. So he asked me to come there and write a play for his company. And uh, it took me a year and a half going back and forth to just see all their actors and, and get an idea. Simultaneously, the theater, I, I live in Sag Harbor, Long Island, New York. And uh, the theater in, in Sag Harbor, Bay Street, commissioned me to write a play for them. So you write for people. I, mean, I write for and people. Right. And that's your inspiration, really. Right. And the, the sympathetic magic that I'd started, Second Stage called me and said, we'd like to commission you to write a play. Isn't this fun? You know. <laughs> and because uh, Circle Rep didn't commission me. That was just, I just did it. Well, they actually paid Suddenly you I was it. getting, uh, getting real American pay. dollars yeah. for it. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I accepted all three of those commissions just as though I was going to have that amount of time. And, and to my credit, I finished them all, but it was very exciting writing for for those th three companies. Uh, what what are your influences as a playwright? God, to go back, uh, I tell you what, I was always excited by theater and always loved it. The first thing I saw, when we're talking high school now, that thrilled me was uh, Death of a Salesman, I'm sorry, the name went right out of my head for a second. Death of a Salesman, uh, if you know it or if you don't, the guy, the, guy is, the guy is having fantasies. They live in a house that is, tenements have been built around it, and they have this little house in the middle of it that's been there for hundreds of years, or been there for as long as they've had it anyway, for 50 years. And uh, so side that's bar, a set. That's sidebar, a set. my students are studying it right now. Oh, I yeah? Just, I just showed them two different versions of it, oh, so great, go on. great, great, great. Uh, so he's in this little house, and there are these big brick walls. And, and in the first production I saw, from apartment building to apartment building, above their house, they had strung a uh, uh, clothesline, and there were things hung on the. Uh, and he starts talking. This guy starts going into the reverie about the way it was, and he was on stage by himself. And he starts talking to people as though they were answering him, saying, what, what? No, come on. I, and glorying in the old days. And suddenly I was in shock, realized that the apartment buildings had vanished, and there were these huge, giant elm trees where the apartments had been. How they did it, I didn't have a clue, but my God, right in front of your face. And, 
And I was thrilled. It just like someone shot one of those drugs that I've never had into me. Uh, <laughs> and, and then so I watched very carefully and saw as, as someone from the building started saying, Dad, are you all right? And stuff like that. Uh, or whatever happens. If you're studying it, you'll find out. Uh, uh, and I probably said it completely wrong. Anyway, when this dream started fading, I watched the trees fade and the buildings come back. And I found out only when I went to that school four years later how they had done it. Uh, one just superimposed to the other. And it was suddenly we were back to, oh, shoot, here we are back in in reality in the, with the old building. Okay, two years, a year later, I saw Brigadoon Touring Company and came to Springfield, Missouri, and the same damn thing happened. You know, suddenly Brigadoon appeared out of nowhere, and oh my God, you know, how did they do that? Well, completely differently. I still don't know how they did that. So you're a cross between Brigadoon and Arthur Miller. I am right? a cross between <laughs> Brigadoon and Arthur Miller. A, 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 a cheap, fabulous musical and a, and a and a very nice play. What? And I'm spitting all over the table. <laughs> what is your usual pattern of, of writing? Is there oh, a usual no, pattern? I, I can tell you exactly. Yeah, I have a usual pattern. I say, I don't have an idea in my head. I never should have started this. People expect me to continue doing it. Uh, and I go around pestering all of my friends, saying, I can't think of anything. I have no idea. I. I re have I said anything that sounded like a play? No, no. <laughs> well, God, well, I, I don't know. And I drive them crazy. They say, Lanford, shut up about it. And then I say, well, there, there was that idea I had about, oh, God. About, and then that started start, starts taking hold, and then I, and then I write it. Uh, but so, so there has always been something back there that, that I had forgotten, usually, that I'd had an idea for a play and said, no, that'll never work. With the play I wrote for Jeff Daniels, <coughs> I, uh, I said, I have no idea. I was writing this play for them. Oh, God, what a bad idea. It was a, it was a, 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 what, a change of life play about who cares and about people I don't care a damn thing about. And I thought well, they were funny, I thought. I, I mean, I thought they were amusing. Uh, boring, worst word in the English language, amusing. Uh, anyway. I had no play for them. I, I, I read 14 pages of that. Uh, a, a friend of uh, a mutual friend of ours, Tim Mason, also a playwright, a wonderful writer, read those 14 pages. I said, "What does that sound like to you?" And he says, "It sounds like someone searching for a play." And I said, "Yeah, that's what I thought." <laughs> so that's exactly what it was. So, and then one day I was I was looking at books to be read, the section you know I've, like like 20 foot long row of books that you haven't read yet that you bought and intended to read. And one of them was a book called Playing Joan, because I had had the idea of what would it be like in a small town that had a community theater, the girl that's usually the second lead in their musicals, <laughs> and other we in other words, not an actress, who was like maybe the, the, the bookkeeper down at the local whatever, furniture factory or cheese factory. What would it be like if she got the part of St. Joan, which she's never considered real theater before in her life? And just happened to be St. John, just happened to have all the attributes, the, the spine and the stick to and the, and the morality, which she never knew about and neither did anyone else. And what would it do to her? What would that do to the town? And, and then I bought a book called, and I saw a book called Playing Joan, and I said, oh, damn it, someone's already done it. And I bought the book and read enough to know that, no, this is, this is interviews, very nice interviews with people who played Joan. Not all about their personal life or what it did to them. It was just about playing Joan. And like an asshole, I put it up in the, on the uh, shelf and, and, and never wrote the play. Uh, so it somehow evaporated. <coughs> and I said, I do have an idea for a play. And it's perfect for a Midwest theater. This theater was a small theater in the Midwest, the only perfect. play in town. You know, perfect. And... Uh, so that's where plays come from. You know, you had the idea 20 years ago and forgot all about it. It's happened innumerable times. Uh, it hasn't happened recently because I ain't got no ideas left. But so you say. Well, I, I haven't seen one. Well, three years, not 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 a word. That's very unusual for me. We'll see. Well, we'll see. But the bad thing happened. I have, I was always, as I said, running around tell, telling everyone, "Oh my God, I'm not writing. I'm not writing." 
and feeling horrible about it and being very upset. There came a day about four years ago when I said, I don't have an idea in my head and I don't care. Uh, and it shocked me. It shocks me now that I was so complacent. At the time, I said, isn't that great? I don't care if I ever write another play again. I don't have an idea and I don't care. This coincided with a great deal of alcohol and a great deal of drugs, you understand. <laughs> and uh, after I shook that, I have been saying, okay, all right now, have an idea, think of something, hasn't happened. But I am beginning to drive all my friends crazy. So that's a very good sign. That's, that's a good sign, but it, it, and it begins to scare me. So, so I'm a little scared now, but I still don't have an idea in my head. Uh, but I don't have an idea in my head, and I've got to, well, you know, We'll talk if I've said that. anything that sounded like it might be a play. Let him know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lance, I got the high sign to wrap up. and uh, You're just getting started. I know. I, uh, it's been we can wonderful. start telling the truth in another 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. They don't want to hear that. I know. They actually, they do. <laughs> uh, it's, been, uh, it's been wonderful. Well, it's been great sitting here talking to you. We haven't yeah. talked in a long time. That's right. And um, I, um, it felt like the... The old days. That's what it felt like. Yeah, I did. And it did. Uh, uh, thank you. Only for none of, neither one of us is drinking anymore. Damn. That's right. <laughs> thank you, Lanford, and our home and our, our, our studio audience for joining us today. And uh, I hope to see you all again for further conversations. And uh, we're going to have a, a now a, a, a brief uh, a question and answer period. Uh, but first, I wanted to thank you. Oh, it's been fun. I do. Really I wonder how your feelings are coming to a a work that is absolutely mm, unchangeable. You have you have to be flexible. If you're inflexible, you're you're in trouble. How difficult do you think it is now to actually get a hit on Broadway without having a television star or? or a, a super corporation supporting a, a, a work that comes comes along it's damn near impossible I tell you I tell you how it can be done uh, I'm think I'm trying to think of, of some show that's come in and been a big hit with no stars in them and they can be a big hit if they're done in England first and our reviewers go over and say oh my god what a brilliant play 